My plan is to talk about uh, four things this afternoon. First, the um, status of U.S. climate regulation as it relates to the electric power industry. Uh, the second is new developments in uh, environmental uh, regulation other than climate change uh, as it affects the electric power industry. Third, I'm going to talk about some uh, recent developments at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, and finally, some uh, legal issues concerning related uh, energy matters. Now, let's take a look at where the U.S. is right now. So the U.S. Um, has been in an expansion, so the recession is over, technically. The recession is technically over, but GDP is uh, stagnant. Uh, we're going to talk about um, Chinese outward direct investment in the United States here. But we're really going to talk about more than just that issue, because what that is showing us is what level of maturity Chinese companies are at. The rise of China intersects with a moment in the American consciousness where we're thinking about ourselves as in decline, which has been really, I think, sharply exacerbated by the partisan gridlock in Washington. The current level of partisan conflict, at least in, in my lifetime and in the last 50 years of American political history, is really extraordinary. And, you know, in another couple of weeks, we're going to be up to $7 billion. Well, Those people have to go somewhere. I mean, the, the idea that they have no impact on resources uh, or on the planet's uh, ecosystem is just ludicrous. The planet's not that big. I mean, it's big, but it's not that big. The idea of governments intervening, taking control, and in a sense taking over major private institutions in times of crisis is something which is fundamentally acceptable in the European historical psyche. It is something which is fundamentally unacceptable and shocking in the United States. I think the answer is an urban density, no question. But when we do that, we can't isolate people from nature. It's where we feel good. It's where we're at our best. So I think the other issues of urban agriculture, um, biophilia is the terminology that we use, uh, are very, very important as we plan for a green and sustainable future. My work is really about light. It's all about understanding the phenomenology of light, primarily daylight, but also artificial light. And uh, I became involved in uh, working with light as a medium basically in the late 1960s when I was in school and uh, that basically led me into glass as a material to capture and manifest and sort of explore qualities of light. So technically in the next three or four years uh, we will be able to allow a car to go door to door driving itself. It would sense pedestrians, it would sense bicyclists, it would handle all forms of traffic and intersections. So of course the, the next generation of planning software will be able to do that automatically. So you get from the satellite image to some kind of planning model without the handwork. Cities seem to be efficient, yet there are many, many problems there in living there. Uh, if you can address some of those issues that we're talking about here, um, you're touching on some of the core problems of the planet, right? They're the problems of cities, if we all move there, are converging with the bigger problems of the planet today. Um, the politics of this is that you know, the fossil fuel industry in the US is very big and very powerful. And it's been able to block any moves to tax the use of fossil fuels. So instead, the government has had to move to subsidizing non-fossil fuels. I mean, you see some of that in Europe, obviously, in Germany, in Spain, in Italy for the feed-in tariffs. Um, but that's basically the main policy lever here in the US, subsidizing non-fossil fuels. And this so um, you can think of this as, as kind of couples therapy for, for the marriage between science and policy. And we, we work very much at that interface. Um, we can link air quality concerns and climate concerns uh, much more easily now. Well, I would like to argue that it is actually possible to get CO2 back out of the air at a price you can afford. And if that's true, it opens all sorts of interesting options. You can, you can make fuels out of it, or you could bury it, depending on what you want to do with it. What EDF has been supporting, that is the Alliance program, 
is a program that involves every part of Columbia, all of our nine professional schools, uh, and the arts and sciences, which include the doctoral programs, and our undergraduate college as well. Um, this means that uh, it's the most important program, I think, of uh, academic and cultural exchange that we have uh, with any other part of the world. And it brings Columbia together with three French institutions who are uh, wonderful partners. Hee <laughs> hee